Welcome to Keeping It Real, where we have real conversations with real people, and we always come from a place of love. Welcome back. We're back in the studio. Uh, we haven't been in the studio for a while. We've been out and about in the community, showing what the what great things we have to offer in Colombia, and so it's been really great. We're going to continue that series of going out and about in Colombia, but today we're going to be in the studio, and I have a very special guest. Dr. Stephen Graves, who is a professor of political science and black studies at the University of Missouri. So welcome. Wonderful. Welcome, Thank welcome. you so much. It's yes. a pleasure. I've had the opportunity to meet you, and uh, we've been at some various um, events. Mm -hmm. And um, I have been thinking lately about um, the things going on in our, in our, in our country right now, mm -hmm. around the idea of um, um, the various branches of government and how that is the checks and balances. I remember when I was in high school, we all learned about that. Right. And, um, in light of um, a lot of the different little political things going on, I thought it would be a great opportunity to kind of visit that, and who better to do it with but a professor of political science. So, um, because I'm a little confused now. Right. Um, you know, I always thought we had the various branches of government, the judicial branch, mm -hmm. the legislative branch, and the executive, executive branch. branch. Mm -hmm. And it just seems like they're all muddled together. And nobody's checking and balancing anybody. Right. So uh, before we get into that, I want to talk a little about you and all tell right. me um, a little about yourself and how you got to Columbia mm -hmm. and how you got to be a political science professor, which oh, I was a poli sci major in college, by really? the way. Yes. Right so. on. <laughs> uh, well, originally when I went to undergrad, I was uh, going to be a pre-law major. And like I told the students yesterday, you know, I walked into the classroom for orientation and the place was just packed. There's too many people in there, and uh, I didn't feel like I could have the kind of significance and impact and change that I wanted to with so many people kind of following the same path, and I always kind of wanted to set out and do my own thing and chart my own course. My parents had always made me kind of community-minded, and you know, especially about the black community and just you know, problem solving and being active and, and a source of social activism, social justice. Mm -hmm. um, so I knew I wanted to kind of make changes. I wanted to be involved in the community, especially the black community. Uh, I had come from a traditionally and predominantly white neighborhood, uh, predominantly white colleges for the most part until I went to Howard as a PhD student. And so, uh, you know, my experiences and just the kind of environment to, uh, that I kind of grew up in and the kind of, you know, lack of value of black, during Black History Month and the kind of education and curriculum and how those things kind of spoke to me was always missing and lacking. So I knew that college was going to be the, pretty much the best opportunity that I had to really do that. And so at first I thought I could do it through the legal process, through you know being a, a, a lawyer and going that route. Uh, but once I got involved in politics and, and had a better understanding about how things work in this country and why decisions are made, because that's really, really what I wanted to know. Who makes decisions? Why do they make these decisions? And what decisions are they really coming to? And what's the under, uh, underlying process behind mm -hmm. that? So that's, why, so that's when I got involved in politics. Uh, so once coming in from uh, you know, as an undergrad and having the opportunity to kind of see how this conversation about how the country was structured and how it works, and I still kept looking for where black people were in these conversations, mm -hmm. right? I'm looking out through history, I'm looking through the political structure of this country, and I'm looking for the black people and, and, and I'm looking for the ideas and the philosophies and understanding about how black people got into the position that they were in. Uh, and so that got me into political science. <clears throat> it's just, I, I thought it was the best avenue for me mm -hmm. to understand change, who was making decisions and to kind of educate people about that decision-making process. Mm -hmm. So that's how I got involved in political science. Mm -hmm. uh, the beauty, of course, then that brought me here to Missouri is uh, a great department in black studies who saw you know, a lot of promise and wanted to kind of chart a course in black politics and studying political science from the black perspective. Um, there was, of course, in this campus in the last two years, a lot of issues taking place right. surrounding race. Um, Were you around at the time when? I got here uh, the right year after? afterwards, um, okay. which is interesting. Is that part of what brought you here? Yeah, I think so, absolutely. You know, I've had opportunities to go other places, but I really felt like the stars were aligned, and my mom always kind of, you know, talked to me about a sense of purpose and, you know, you know, kind of going where there was kind of a calling. And so after the events on campus uh, and the kind of way that it played out in the media and the way that it played out on campus at the university, uh, for them to then, you know, offer musicians to come here and teach, I felt like it was very important with, uh, you know, with my education and what my, you know, research and what my kind of background was educationally to come here and be just a great opportunity for me to kind of assist and to mm -hmm. add some discourse. I was younger and I had a, you know, a expertise that was uh, a little bit more vibrant and confrontational uh, about the dialogue. It was different. It was it was unique kind of perspective that mm -hmm. I had. 
about politics and how black people kind of associate with it. Uh, I think we all felt that uh, the students on this campus, younger, could could benefit from that. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was a, just a great opportunity, I think, with the stars aligning with the great department uh, and a need on this campus and university to kind do, of talk about the black experience in politics. Do you do you feel that you found that to be the case once you've got here? Have you been able to have those kind of dialogues? And when we talk about what happened in Kansas, we're talking about when the Black Lives Matter. Yep, uh, and the and the uh, hunger strike, and right. then the issue with Peyton had the student body president, of course, and the issues on campus that he had there, and the protests and stuff, right. and then the ultimate resigning of the president and right. everything else. It was just um, but, just to remind the audience of, yeah. of of what we're talking about. Most people probably know, but there would be some th th folks that didn't know. Right. So even yeah. so, now the first year that I got here, there was a racial incident on campus. Uh, my first year here, right, where there were some uh, African-American female students who were walking, uh, you know, back on campus, and some students from above from a fraternity. Uh, yelled down, racial slurs down to them. The police were eventually called and they have kind of confrontational with the black students who were trying to tell them that the white students above them had been calling the N-word and everything else right. was. And so there was a big town hall about that and so every single year we kind of have a you know year in review or kind of you know try mm -hmm. to measure and check our progress since those incidents in 2015 uh, to kind of where we are today. Do we feel like we have made some progress? Do you feel like we've made some progress? Because you've been here like how many I've been here now two years two now. Years. So okay. pretty much since the incident moving forward. So I'm kind of really kind of tracking and monitoring from the two years progress really since then. Uh, have we made progress? Um, tangible progress? I would probably say no. You know, I think that we're in uh, taking the right steps. We're trying to set the blueprint for which uh, we can see progress made. But the problem and the kind of issue with a lot of these institutions and see racial changes, there's still a kind of a bottom line profit motive with public education. I mean, we're mm. a state run institution, state run school, right? So having fannies in the seats is still a priority. And if you're right. not having students in there to then pay tuition that then helps fund right. the projects and stuff going on the, on the campus and around the school and around the community, right? Mm -hmm. The high rises and the new student you know, buildings and student housing that they want to put up, well, you have to have them open to have those. So they're really trying to address racial problems mm -hmm. while also then getting fannies in the seats. Right. Uh, but being in a unique place like Missouri, there are, uh, you know, people who are still wholly, you know, staunched into the kind of traditions of Missouri. Okay. And they see the kind of, you know, racial conversation, the racial narrative, you know, the re requirements to have students participate in more diverse courses and diverse learning and have education in more diverse areas. Some people in this state or even in this country still see that as not important, kind of egghead, liberal, kind of elitist kind of a thing, indoctrination of young minds and everything else it is. So some people, you know, wouldn't like to see the, send their kids to Mizzou or don't want to see their kids go to Mizzou over indoctrination of liberal ideologies and kind of racial inclusion and all these things that they feel they shouldn't become necessarily college for, right? You're there to, you know, get a college degree so you can get a job, be a productive member of society, maybe find your significant other, get married mm -hmm. and have that whole, you know, right. picket fence. So some people don't want to send their kids to to uh, you know, racial progressing, progressive kind of place. But do you find that that is not just that Mizzou in terms of the need for that, but that is something you see across higher education that absolutely. across the country? Oh, absolutely. So, so it's not just Mizzou that thinks it's important. No. That, but, but why do why is it important? Because why is it important? Well, I think. And I'm, and is this something very very new? Um, it's not new. No, I think the thing that makes a difference between at the educational or K through 12 level um, versus a place like University of Missouri is, again, most public high schools that are funded through the state and everything else is, aren't really necessarily trying to make a profit. They're not really trying to make money. Uh, they get you know grants and bonds and stuff through the state for them to update their uh, facilities and get new equipment and stuff like that it is. But as far as kind of turning a profit, you know, most public high schools and elementary schools and all that K through 12, and that's not really their kind of main motivation. It's not really what they're kind of really designed to do. Uh, but for public universities like Mizzou and everything else, this profits is a big part, right? That's okay. how they, you know, again, build new, you know, stadiums, and that's how they kind of fill more fannies and seats, and they bring guest speakers, and bring up the prestige, and they get a bigger endowment. So, so it is a business part of universities. Yes, and that's uh, and that's it, one of the main yeah. differences between the K through 12 okay. is that there's a business model to public education, okay. uh, and the, and that profit motive really changes the incentive and it really changes people's motivations and aspirations. Doing the right thing at the cost of dollars is sometimes it's difficult. Mm -hmm. Like I would like to make these changes. I would like to see more inclusive in, uh, you know, racial diversity. But at, at the expense of students in my seats, which ultimately gives me a raise, which ultimately brings more prestige to the campus. But, it's, but it seems like to me, I mean, if you look at uh, the University of Missouri that the enrollment is down mm -hmm. based on what I've seen. Yeah. My take on it is that it shows that the lack of diversity and the lack of inclusion does not pay. It hurts your bottom line. So to not have it and to not try to build these inclusive communities and to not try to educate our students to understand that we are a we are we are a a diverse 
country world and to not mm -hmm. understand the implications of what that means. Yeah. I mean, because businesses understand that. They right. try to make sure that their, their organizations reflect those who understand the, the best business model for the bottom line. Right. I mean, it's not, not, not that it's just not the right moral thing to do, but it's the right business thing to do because you're not serving. We have a global economy. So right. Well, that's the thing about businesses, though, that they have a target audience. Mm -hmm. Right, so place of things like Mountain Dew and Dorito chips and certain kind of burgers, right? They are targeting an 18 to 25 year old kind of young fast food munchy kind of demographic. Mm -hmm. And they have done research to know what those kids want to see in commercials that bring them to the place, whether it be a certain looking kind of female or fast cars or action packed and everything else it is, right? So mm -hmm. they have a target audience. Uh, certain shoe companies that d that direct their attention strictly for males that are popular shoe brand, right? So they know they're talking to boys at a certain age or they know they're talking to uh, a certain age demographic and they tailor the message to that group. Universities under business model operate the same way, right? So you would ask, you know, the, it's been declining enrollment for the last couple, couple of years. And previous to that, they had booming en uh, enrollment, which is why they mm -hmm. added the new complexes for new student housing. So what's the difference in the last couple of years? Uh, again, I would say that one of them, of course, is that p a lot of people do not think that diversity in certain aspects is a good thing. And that's just a fact of our current society, and I think you see it kind of play out in politics. Some people like things that the way that they were. Tradition, a traditional Mizzou, traditional country, before a lot of these kind of inclusion, before a lot of the kind of racial talk and making everything about race and everything about immigration and all these kind of things. Some people do wish for an older way, and they want to spend their money on an older way. Mm -hmm. And so spending their dollars on things that don't really align with their values, some people are no longer willing to do. And then, of course, then you're absolutely right. A lot of kids on the minority side don't want to come to a campus that they perceive to be racist racist and mm -hmm. where they're constantly under attack mm -hmm. and where there's not a vibrant African-American or black community on campus and in the campus community, mm -hmm. places of, you know, social gatherings and, uh, and other mm -hmm. places, right, and a vibrant social scene for them who are still feel comfortable and everything mm -hmm. else to this. You can only be on a college campus for so long before you want to get out the neighborhood. You so. know, it's always so, so interesting because I always viewed, okay, so I went to school, I went to college in the 80s, mm -hmm. early 80s. Um, I went to UCLA undergrad. All right, and now. so... Um, and I, and I remember back then, though, it just, that the idea of being more inclusive back then in the 80s. I mean, it was not, uh, it was not as predominant an idea. Mm -hmm. But even back then, there was this idea of that we needed to um, ensure that the folks that we're educating are more reflective of the society and where we were going. Because um, politically and in terms of uh, statistically, mm -hmm. in terms of the folks of color in this country, those numbers were gonna start going up. Right. And so we had to prepare for it. There was that notion that we needed to prepare for that and that that was not a bad thing. Right. I don't know that I feel that way now that it seems like people perceive the demographics of our country changing as a bad thing. People think- It's well, almost like we were preparing for it back in the 80s. Uh, well, we saw, we saw that, again, like you were saying, that there was value in it, right? We needed more diverse ideas, and we had to provide resources to a population that is currently being held out of higher education, where we have got to create a way, and we can't rely on the moral fabric mm -hmm. or the moral compass of certain individuals who have mm -hmm. the say to do this on their own. So we have mm -hmm. to create an incentive and or some kind of order for which we can get these people into, uh, into education. Uh, of course, when you stage it as that black people all getting, in, you know, getting into college free things, so that automatically upsets right. some people, right? Mm -hmm. So you've already created enemies there by saying black mm -hmm. people getting into college they wouldn't mm -hmm. normally get to. So there's already right. a segment already portioned off. Well, but then the other thing too is that the people look at statistically, the people who most benefited not from, black from that were white women. Yeah. And the, and international students, and international students uh, right. you know, ethnic exactly. whites from from, from exactly. Europe, and then coming right. in everything else. So it's not even necessarily right. being a black thing. So right. that's the other thing. And then obviously, and now we've got to, and part of the thing that you're talking about now is people think we've just gone too far. People mm -hmm. think that this whole diversity push, you've had it from diversity, right? You've had a black president. you got black billionaires and black millionaires now and black TV shows, okay? So we've done enough with the racial indoctrination and the racial kind of, you know, diversity thing, right? Let's get back to creating great good citizens of the citizens. And on the other hand, people don't want their children learning about race or being indoctrinated about racial conversation out on college campus. You're not there to, to get your character. Get your character from your pastor, from your parents, uh, from your people, that, your mentors and advisors. That's where you go to get your mental compass. You go to college to, yes, the experience and be in an open mind setting with other individuals, but you're there to learn and you're there to get a job. It's, it's a very profitable, you know, and understanding. You're not there to learn about your moral character and behavior. And if once we get schools trying to push racial inclusion and racial diversity as a moral thing, you've gone too far. And some people think that we have gone too far. And that 
black people have accomplished enough. We don't need special education, special handouts, right? You, again, you've got enough successful black people from presidents and millionaires and movie stars and athletes that it's no longer required to have these certain kind of diversity initiatives. When black people can be successful enough, the country has changed, there's no overt racism out there that's holding you back now. You can achieve and succeed if you want to. And that, so this need to kind of continually push racial inclusion and push racial diversity, for some, is, again, is, is just too much. We've gone too but far. I, but I think, that, but I, I can see that folks think, but. This is deeper than that. It's deeper than just the idea of when we come to college, we're there to, like you said, that college is not to define your moral compass, but that comes from other. I think it has to be a, it has to be both of those aligning together. Oh, absolutely. I think both that's what the purpose of education together. is. Yes. It's, it's, it's education and your character building, right. right? Those things should be right. and do go, I believe, hand in hand, and that should right. be really the purpose of education. And I don't know how we, I mean, if, if statistically in terms of the demographics of this country will continue to uh, progress as it is, mm -hmm. eventually there will be the majority of folks in our country will be people of color. Absolutely. So then how do you not how do you not prepare for a country that leaders will be diverse, our country will be diverse? Well, and then how do we become the greatest country in the world if that we're not prepared to live together in a way that is inclusive? Well, one of the things about the, what people have identified and called the kind of burning of America, right, where brown and dark-skinned people will be the new majority in this country, is that is combining all the different ethnic groups together into one. So collectively, the whites, will st white people will still be the majority in this country. Mm -hmm. You have to combine African Americans and Hispanics and the Asian population and Native Americans mm -hmm. and Asian Americans combined into one group to have the majority. Mm -hmm. But as we know, probably me and you and people in the, you know, in the world will probably know, you're not going to necessarily get al alignment and agreement amongst African Americans and Hispanics and or mm -hmm. Asians and or other ethnic groups. Right. right? There's a lot of contention and disputation amongst these groups individually, let alone amongst each other. I mean, right. African Americans and so how they're treated in certain neighborhoods at markets that aren't owned by them, that are owned by other ethnic groups and that mm -hmm. kind of treatment. Mm -hmm. So this idea that all the brown people will just come together and, and as a solid majority and be able to make all these things happen, all these waves, is a little naive when whites will still be the overarching majority, which still gives them then, if they can pluck and divide and conquer and kind of fraction these uh, ethnic groups into little smaller little sects, that will still give them the p political advantage mm -hmm. to win out in d democratic elections and, and hold a certain standard uh, over the country as far as the establishing mm -hmm. the status quo. One of the things though that is when you're talking about then how do we kind of make a move and plan and what makes us then great is incorporating those ideas from different groups of people and making them part of the American story and by showing the benefits that all groups can get from having other cultures. It's not good enough just to have one dominant group uh, that has the monopoly over culture and standards of beauty and all the other standards. The key, of course, is having different ones and then show how other groups can benefit from other people's culture. And that is really the missing link that I think that you're getting at is that we're not really demonstrating and exercising the benefits that come from other people's culture. We really just try to fit in and slide it in after we've already have our own established culture, measuring it against the dominant culture, but we really don't see, well, what is the benefits of Hispanic education, Hispanic religion, Hispanic, Hispanic cultural practices, and everything else? It's how do white people benefit from those? Hmm. How do blacks? We don't really have that conversation. And, and else we're going to continue that conversation. So this is um, this has been, this is going to be a great, um, I'm so happy to have you, and so um, there's this some deep stuff that we're talking about right now. <laughs> Absolutely. And so we're going to continue that when we come back. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Eris, how long before everything is powered by the internet? It's only a matter of time. The future will demand more speed, bigger bandwidth, and a whole new level of reliability. At Mediacom, we're leading the way, and so is the entire state of Iowa. With gigabit internet now available in every community Mediacom internet serves, our cities are faster and more powerful than some of the biggest in the country. So bring it on. The future is now in Iowa. It's happened to you. You left your cell phone in the car. Forgot it while rushing out of the office had it hijacked by your toddler, or let the battery run down. Sure, cell phones are great, but not if you or your kids are searching for one in an emergency. Call Mediacom today and add the reliability of a home phone for just $4.99 a month for a year. Call us at 888-SIMPLIFY. It's your home. 
It's your family. It's everything that matters most in your world. And Mediacom Home Controller keeps it all connected and protected. Make sure the doors are locked. Check in on the kids. Easily manage your home settings from anywhere and go to bed with greater peace of mind. Add Mediacom Home Controller for as low as $24.99 per month for 36 months. Call today for details. When you download the Mediacom Connect mobile care app, you can troubleshoot issues, look at your data usage, pay your bill, get appointment reminders, and even schedule a time for us to call you without ever leaving the couch. It's like having your own customer service agent. Remember, your TiVo install is tomorrow. And technician right in your phone. Mediacom Connect Mobile Care. Download the free app today from iTunes or Google Play. So we're going to continue our conversation with Dr. Graves. And, you know, we talked earlier in the early segment and the idea of a lot of these ideas of inclusion mm -hmm. and diversity amongst different uh, groups of folks. And the idea that you are a political science professor as well as a black studies, I see how those two do go hand in hand, how mm -hmm. they converge on each other mm -hmm. and impact each other. I want to go back to um, earlier in, in the show, I talked about the various branches of government right. because especially in light of what's going on right now mm -hmm. and it just seems that um, that I don't feel that the various branches of government who our four our founding fathers created to be at checks and balances that that's really going on right. so let's kind of start off with a little education yes, training. Indeedy. so that, talk to me about um, the various branches and really what they're supposed to do okay because it don't seem like they know what they're supposed to do right now right okay so originally right the legislative branch in Congress was supposed to have the most influence and the most power in the kind of structuring of government right mm -hmm. because they come from separate states and because you have the House of Representatives that have more kind of a, a local feel and a Senate that has a little bit more statewide feel, that those would be the kind of places where you would get the most representation of the ideas of the American people, right? Their states would send rep members, which then send representatives then to the federal government, and those representatives would know what people in that state want. Mm -hmm. And so, so when they go to write laws and write bills and vote on them, that people in those states would be represented. So that Congress and legislative branch would initially be the most powerful branch in government. They have the most kind of direct linkage uh, with members of the states uh, and individual citizens in those states. And then so then the president, of course, is, as the executive there, obviously with foreign relations and kind of directing of our military and everything else it is, also to kind of be the kind of uh, symbol of our state and kind of uh, representative of the state overall and represent us in foreign relations and other international organizations and kind of be the executive, right? He's there to make sure that things that come out of Congress actually get done. So yes, he has a huge say in kind of, you know, narrowing that focus and providing some incentive and ideas, but Congress is right the laws and he is there to make sure that they get fulfilled. So once you okay. pass the budget cut, he's in charge through his cabinet of making sure that those taxes stuff get seen, those roads get built, those streets get paved. It's his job to execute okay. the laws that get passed. The judicial branch is pretty much there to settle the laws and disputes and have a system of checks and balances that keeps those other two branches in check and to make sure that what those two branches of government do don't get too uh, extreme or too powerful and infringe upon our liberties and our kind of natural mm -hmm. rights. Um, so they just are there to make sure that what the president signs and what Congress legislates doesn't become unconstitutional, right? So it wasn't even until after, uh, you know, the forming through, you know, Madison versus Marbury where they had to figure out what is the Supreme Court, you know, supposed to be doing. And it wasn't until we, you know, we got to that point where we said they're there just to interpret the Constitution. Mm -hmm. They're there to make sure that whatever comes out of, of, the, of Congress and the executive branch is constitutional and that's pretty much just about it. So when we talk about so as far as what they do, and now leading into a system of checks and balances, right, the idea, of course, is that we didn't want one of those branches to ever be too powerful, right? Okay. We just left tyranny. We just left a monarchy in that kind of, of that kind of, you know, absolute state. And we were afraid of having one branch being too powerful. So we wanted to have these branches be able to kind of check the power of one another so no mm -hmm. one got too big. Uh, so the president, if, the, if something that Congress does is too extreme or, or gets too far, the president has the ability to veto it and, and to keep it from getting too big. Uh, the, if the president signs something, the Congress can go back and just, uh, you know, write and create a law then that kind of supersedes the power of the president, make sure the president doesn't do things too much. And Congress has the power of the purse, so they write the mm -hmm. bills for, for the mm -hmm. country, so the president mm -hmm. is really inhibited by mm -hmm. money there. The Supreme Court, again, is there to make sure that what the president does 
and what the Congress does is always constitutional. So mm -hmm. if they ever try to do anything too extreme that's unconstitutional, the Supreme Court can come in and say, no, keep your power in check. This keeps mm -hmm. you from kind of coming to extreme. And all of those branches are there to serve the country. The, not an individual. They are meant to serve, yep, public, the common good or the public good. And even the president, he's not there to serve, he's not there to serve himself right. or herself, but there to serve the will of the country. Absolutely. So, you know, I like greatly we see what's going on in a country right now. So one of the, one of the things that I found was really interested um, in trying to understand, I know that we had um, that the Congress passed a um, sanctions. Mm -hmm. And then, and then I'm not trying to get political now. I'm just trying to understand right. practically some of the things that are going on. Because I'm sure that some of the same folks out there have some of the same questions I'm having about some of this stuff, trying to understand Absolutely. It. So one of the things that, that, that I, I'm trying to understand mm -hmm. is that, okay, my understanding is that the Congress passed sanctions for Russia. Mm -hmm. But yet the president has not um, initiated those yet. Right. So my understanding is was that when Congress passed something but by the whole by the majority, which I understand they did, mm -hmm. that isn't the president obligated to and it could be sanctions, it could be anything that they passed a hundred percent, that I thought the president was legally required to initiate those. No, and saying, and that's okay. one of the the big assumptions of stuff that we have. Okay, and, you know, think back to Brown versus Board of Education and school segregation, right? Even after Brown versus Board, schools didn't start getting desegregated until years and years later. Right. Why? Because, like we were saying about the powers of the president and the executive branch, they are there to execute the law. So Congress can write whatever bills stuff that they want to, but without someone to execute those okay. through various branches of government or federalism to make those things happen, they just go by the wayside, right? So the Congress passed, you know, desegregation of schools. The Supreme Court upheld it. But without a president to say, yes, I'm going to forcibly make you okay. desegregate these schools, a lot, many states were allowed to keep the segregated schools the way that they were because there was no one there to enforce them and execute mm. dual school desegregation. So many states, even after Brown versus Board, just kept it pushing until someone bring in the stormtroopers, you know, bring in the troops okay. and made you do it. And so that had to happen by the president. President has to enforce has to that and have to execute that. that. So okay. Congress passes, you know, sanctions on, on a state, but if the president doesn't enforce those and execute those, then it's just... A, and the president a, a bill doesn't and have idea. to. And the president doesn't necessarily have to. And okay. the thing about the Supreme Court is, the Supreme Court is prim primarily idle in this country. It's reactionary. Mm -hmm. So unless someone petitions the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court really doesn't work. The, they don't have like mm -hmm. set hour schedules of things <laughs> that they have to see. Uh -huh. So they're only enacted or called into action when someone says, hey, someone is doing something unconstitutional to me. Either the government or an individual of a certain standard or some amount of money at stake. I'm being treated unconstitutionally. But if no one says that, mm -hmm. then Supreme Court doesn't doesn't mm -hmm. move. It doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So until someone says I'm being is unconstitutional for schools that have be segregated, the Supreme Court just sits by and lets schools just you know continue as mm -hmm. they were. So the mm -hmm. Supreme Court in the kind of checks and balances system is really out of the discussion for the most part until someone complains. Mm -hmm. But if no one complains, they kind of sit back and act. And even their decisions need the president to enforce them as mm -hmm. well. So the Supreme Court can make a decision. Five to four, six three. It could be nine zero on a decision, but unless the president actually enforces the ruling mm -hmm. of the Supreme Court, then those laws and rule books mm -hmm. just sit on the uh, and just sit on the uh, on the shelves as well. So that's one of the things when we talk about executive power to, to power to execute those things mm -hmm. that get said. Um, and so that really makes it difficult as far as the keeping things in check. So now what we've got, of course, is now that we've kind of eliminated the Supreme Court as a checks and balances in this kind of discussion. We really, just have two branches of government here. Okay. And now the problem becomes, of course, is two branches of government who are controlled by the same political party, whatever mm -hmm. party it is, right? Because in mm -hmm. Obama's first years, right, Democrats own the, you know, the right. House, the Senate, and so therefore Congress, and the presidency, the executive branch, right? Mm -hmm. So, and when you have two power of the, you know, the two branches of the same party, it's really easy to get things done. I mean, hmm. you're supposed to have some kind of. But somebody need to tell this this Congress we got now that. Well, that's the. <laughs> because well, it's, and, and, but we're that, not getting too much done. And that's the inherent problem. That is an interest of you to say that. Why? Yeah. Why would you say that it should be? And you would think it would because be because there's easy. a party platform. When people th when people think Democrats or people think of the left or the Democratic Party. Again, you're thinking of you know public services, uh, you know tolerance of of of, of marriage and. Um, School so and social services. Uh, they're thinking about Im you know immigration, and they're thinking of uh, you know again the public sector, minimum wage increase. Like when you say Democrat, there's usually a nice little platform, party identification platform that people think of. Mm -hmm. And most Democrats, when you sign to be a Democrat, usually tend to agree on these things, right? Mm -hmm. We see the government being influential in structuring our government. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you have Congress and people who write bills, and a president who then signs off on those bills, and they're usually in agreement. 
Mm -hmm. It's usually pretty easy. Like, hey, we can figure out what to eat. You like Chinese? I like Chinese food. Well, <laughs> picking somewhere to eat is going to be easy. Right. So, okay. so those bills tend to come out a little bit faster. Hence, in those first years of Obama, right? Me, we're, you know, I'm in agreement. You're in agreement about the things we want to get done. You bring me a bill because we're already in some kind of ideological sync. You know, it's easy to sign off on them. And so that's where we are kind of with the Republican Party now. The problem with the current Republican Party is is that there is a break between party. And this is now happening in the Democratic Party too as well with the kind of younger progressive Bernie Sanders generation, right? So now internally within Democrats, you have young progressives, uh, single health pair, uh, higher minimum wage increases, mm -hmm. you know, eliminating the student loan debt, like all these kind of things that far left Democrats advocate mm -hmm. for. And versus standard Democrats who still see you know, some kind of limited function, and, you know, mm -hmm. we still see the needs of business and capitalism still kind of being at the root of our society mm -hmm. and certain status quo. The Republican Party is having the same problem. They have got some who say, we've gone too far, mm -hmm. and government is doing too much. Mm -hmm. We need to go back to when the government did less, you know, mm -hmm. just to, you know, hey, defend our borders, you know, keep us, you know, safe from domestic terrorism, and for the most part, you know, let capitalism kind of do its thing and just keep an eye. So, and so and and some Republicans on that in the same faction then think that the government needs to play a bigger role. There's too many wide varieties of tastes in the country kind of going on, mm -hmm. and that there needs to be more of a say. See that? So well, we th we throw around these terms like um, like we are live on television from a talking heads. It's like when we talk about you're the far left and the far right. What right. are we talking about? Uh, talking Is it an ideology? The ideological spectrum. So okay, so kind of explain what that means. Okay, so on a spectrum from it goes from left to right. Right. Uh, you know, far left it tends to be on an ideological spectrum. All this under the idea of liberalism. Okay. The idea of liberalism, we're talking about uh, individual liberties, expressions. Uh, the idea of uh, individual expression and individual liberties that are exclusive to the individual that can't really be excluded from him and took into government. Right. So okay. it's all in that same branch. Now uh, on the far left and right, you have what that really means as far as government goes wise. So on the left, you have people who say, yes, uh, I'm an individual and individuals are individually good and well, but society has to do a better job of creating peace uh, mm -hmm. and structure. On the right side of things, you have to say people who then argue the point that people are good and well, just like people on the left say, but it's the government's the problem. It's not mm -hmm. the solution. Mm -hmm. People on the far left think the government can solve our problems. People on the far right think that government inherently is the problem of, of inequality and injustice. So the far left progressives, far lefters, um, you tend to get socialism, you know, that tend of communism where the government has a huge role. Mm -hmm. The government plays a huge role in education, public education, standardized educa education. They have a huge role in the economy, determining wages, determining the, the product of goods and services. So for the left, you have larger government. Uh, far the right, you have limited government. So far right, you have not only the conservative ideology, but uh, libertarians mm -hmm. and, and on that sort of thing. People who say government is too big even in, as it currently stands. The only thing that government should really do is defend the borders. Everything else, we can mm -hmm. reasonably figure out for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And the government is just really causing more problems by creating speed limits, by creating alcohol limits, by creating gun mm -hmm. limits, by creating these, by the government getting involved in our personal lives and getting involved in all these other mm -hmm. aspects of government, it creates more problems. Mm -hmm. We're human beings, we're civilized, we mm -hmm. can figure out what food to eat. We don't need to have calories posted on the so, fast food so, windows anymore. So you anymore. can't be far left or far right within a party. Like you can't be a Democrat and be far left or far right. Uh, you can be a Democrat, well, and, and, and so in today's society, it tends to be a little bit more fractured. So in today's okay. society, you've got some people who will call themselves socially liberal and economically conservative. Okay. And you have people who say, well, I'm an economic conservative and a, a social liberal. So people who then on the left side socially think gay marriage okay, Marijuana, uh, you know, legalization perfectly fine with me. Let people kind of live. But on the economic side, I'm a staunch defendant of capitalism. Government stay out of the way. Let people accumulate wealth and money. Mm -hmm. On the so on the flip side of that, you would have people who say, "Hey, I'm a social conservative. Bible me. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, make sure that strict, you know, forms of social inclusion, of uh, family, you know, priorities and moral values mm -hmm. are hugely important. Economically, I think we should have more socialistic networks, and the government should probably pay for more service and everything else it is. So you can kind of flip. Mm -hmm. But the spectrum really goes from left to right, and there okay. are people who are kind of in the middle. In the moderate. In that moderate kind of independence mm -hmm. in the middle. And okay. of course, in that middle, well, there are people who are on the edges. So people who are like left center and then right center. Mm -hmm. So people who are not necessarily socialist, communist, far left and think government should be doing everything, but do believe that the government should do a better job of mm -hmm. handing out economic inequality in certain kind of ways, could do a, you know, do a little bit better job, so kind of tend to be a little bit more center. And are, same are, on the kind of, on the right. Are these ter is this terms, are these terminologies and these kind of ideologies, are they relatively 
new over oh, the my. last 30 years? Because I don't remember hearing a lot about mm -hmm. that when I, maybe because I was just so young. Yeah. But like back in the, in the 80s, like when I, or I think I, I think my first, uh, my first time I was able to vote was when Ronald Reagan ran for president. Right. So I don't remember hearing these terms as much. Yeah. There, a lot of it is, you know, recent phenomena done through, you know, lots of research, a lot of polling and behaviors about really kind of figure out why people decide to back certain things the way they are, especially, okay. you know, internally within the black community and particularly, of course, where we have a kind of a large black church following and a mm -hmm. large kind of religious, spiritual aspect to our culture. Mm -hmm. um, so you're trying to find a lot of people who, again, but they're also poor. So you'll mm -hmm. find them them having very religious backgrounds socially. I'm, you know, I'm staunch about that Bible mm -hmm. and, and that kind of right. structure of morals. But because I'm poor, I also think the right. government should be doing a better job right. of making these right. things happen. So you're kind of getting people who are on those right. uh, on those burgeons. Because it, cause it seems like that. for you know, um, as I've had conversations with with my friends, my African American friends, that um, and even I go back to my own family experience, mm -hmm. and I'm going back generation to generation. Um, I've always perceived most black folks to be pretty conservative. Yeah. Traditionally, we are, and we have been, I mean, uh, up until really the New Deal. I mean, up until the 1920s when the government through FDR just hugely expanded, right? You get, you know, all the new cabinet position, the government, you know, went up by about 100%. Mm -hmm. Black people were conservative, right? Mm -hmm. We were from the belt, you know, Southern Belt, you know, we were Christians, the church, mm -hmm. following moral code. People, you know, work hard, you can build yourself up and make things happen. Government wasn't coming to help us, you really had to kind of do for self. We were staunchly, uh, you know, conservative and, and we Republican. were pretty, very Republican. There were a lot of black Ab folks who were Republican. Absolutely. When did that start to change? In the 50s and 60s, once, so once FDR in the 1920s, Democrats were winning elections, just hand over fist, widespread spread this making a dominating case of control of government, right? And so Southern Re Republicans and people in the South were trying to figure out how do we get back to winning elections and mm -hmm. everything else is. Mm -hmm. One of the things, and this probably will sound familiar, that they figured out is they could do is we've got to, you know, our, you know the, our white demographic. What is most appealing and most central to our white demographic? And it, came, and it came about race. And then what they figured out through research, of course, and through polling and, and interaction was race heavily divided the country and it was a heavy mm. divisive argument and stance in the south and so if you kind of played upon the advantages and the and that were gained by the african-american community since the new deal a lot of white americans perceive that as they're getting better at my expense you're giving mm. black people all these rights and everything else it is that must mean they're taking it you know taking from mm -hmm. me like rights and privileges in this country are a zero-sum game and mm -hmm. so what they figured out is if we tailored our message to that crowd we could come back and win elections again. Mm -hmm. and, they, and this was the method of the Southern strategy where you know, Nixon and, and, you know, and Wallace and, and up until Reagan figured out that white people were monitoring and watching the progress made by blacks and some of them were feeling like the country had gone too far. A lot of them feeling like the blacks were getting better at their expense, thus they were you know, losing out on jobs because black people were getting them. They weren't able to live in certain neighborhoods through the federal housing because black people were living there. And so we could win elections again if we tailored a certain message to those, to that white demographic. And this is where you get now welfare queen images. Mm. Um, with the, with the Willie uh, Horton case, uh, mm -hmm. you know, back in the right. 80s uh, with Dukakis and Bush that won right. him election, right? Because mm -hmm. Dukakis was winning that election in, in, in 80, uh, 88, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Before Bush got there. It wasn't until uh, Dukakis, home state of Massachusetts, left the black guy out of jail. He, you know, right. rapes and kills the I black remember, woman. Yeah. And then Bush goes right to television and says, see, this is what happened, right? Mm -hmm. Black getting out of jail. You see what happened? We have, mm -hmm. you know, liberal Democrats opening up the jails mm -hmm. and letting black people out. This is what happens. And white people obviously ate it up and they swam the election. And so they figured out that, so once blacks start getting that message that they were being used as a, as a ploy, of course, to, uh, to as a damaging message to, uh, to win votes, black people shifted not over 90% over to the Democratic Party beginning in the 60s and everything wow. else it was. You know, so what's so interesting as you, as you talk about that, it's like, I'm like, I'm thinking we're here in 2018 and I see some of these same things. Yeah. Some of these same things that race becomes such an issue with regards to election. But I also think poverty. Absolutely. Uh, poverty and is it's still a, important. And as I wondered, does, has poverty, uh, the new, is poverty the new? Um, race? Yeah. Um, you would wish. Because if that was the case, then poor, then poor blacks or majority of black Americans and poor whites, we should be able to solve a lot of these problems. We should be able to elect certain people. Like, well, you would think that we would have more in common with poor whites politically than we actually do. And that should actually, you know, indeed be the case because we're both being, you know, victimized of a certain standard of, of poverty and the kind of stigma that comes along with it, uh, limited potential, limited resources, uh, and the kind of way the government kind of structures and works itself 
uh, were both kind of being disadvantaged. You would think that poor whites and poor blacks would gain it. But here's the problem. Poor whites still think that they're better than even poor blacks. A lot of poor whites still think that they're even better than rich blacks. So mm -hmm. just getting them to get over the hump of race, and this is what kind of racial superiority and white supremacy kind of pokes at his head, because where poor blacks and poor whites should be getting along, the stigma of race just will not allow poor whites to see themselves as equals, mm -hmm. and not even just equals, but then participants with blacks in, achieve, in achieving some kind of uh, mm -hmm. you know, American idealism or kind of mm -hmm. agreeing kind of political things to accomplish. The inability to get past race to see uh, the things they have in common with blacks, they're not willing to go that far you left. Know, you know, when you say that, it's one of these things, you know, I do a lot of equity training and uh, around, the, uh, around social justice, and there is one of the assumptions that we do when we do this work is the, the idea of that there is no hierarchy of oppression mm -hmm. because all oppression hurts the human spirit. Right. And so when I think about that is that when we, uh, it, because race is such a very difficult thing for, yeah. for, for us to talk about. Us, and I mean us, the collective us, as yeah. just, in, in just folks. Right. It's a very difficult thing to, to, to talk about. And, and that, like you said, are those areas that we should be able to, because around the idea of poverty. Yeah. If you're making black, under $25,000 in right. this country, no matter what color you are, right. you should be working together and, and up in arms right. because uh, your resources are diminishing as we speak. And, mm -hmm. But again, that issue of race just does not allow them to overcome, to see those similarities that we but have. But I think that's also this intentionality of social constructs around the idea of race and poverty. Uh, you know what, what I'm saying? And what we, and what we like, that'd be like, I mean, it's like when when you when you who who says who define what race should be in terms of its negative connotations that this oh, society yeah. has around it. Right. Who decided that the the construct of poverty and the negatives associated with that? Because it's right. those social constructs are the things that keep us from not being able to know that, you know, we're in the Absolutely. same boat when it comes to being poor. Absolutely. Whether you were black or white or green. Yeah. And so that I notion of these intentionalities of these social constructs around the idea of race and poverty, what yeah. that means and how that continues to separate us as a, as a beloved community in order to be able to formulate strength in numbers. Oh yeah, what it means to, to be to poor and what it means to be black do tend to fluctuate and stuff as it is over time. And the black community has this conversation all the time. Are mm -hmm. you black enough? Who's black right. enough and everything else, is, <laughs> right. right? And what it means to be poor. For some people, poor is food stamps. Some people, poor is, I'm not on food stamps, but, I, but I, I'm not on food stamps, but I eat ramen every day and right. where else it is and everything else. I still have to be poor. I can't afford the, you know, the highest fashions and everything else it is. And so that's so that poor. So poor and what it means to be black tend to kind of fluctuate and stuff over time. So it's hard to, um, you know, have a absolute of this is, you know, where the disagreement lies, mm -hmm. which makes it very difficult. Um, but at that same kind of point of advantage are, there are still some kind of emotional realities that people are unwilling to overcome. And uh, we're going to talk about that when we come back. You bet. We're going to continue this fascinating mm -hmm. conversation, difficult conversations that, yeah. we, that we have around the idea of race and, and uh, really around the idea of race. I think that's one of the most difficult conversations to have. Absolutely. Um, but I think we got to have those conversations because we're always coming from a place of love. And yeah, if, that's right. if we're going to build these beloved communities, we got to talk about the tough stuff. Mm -hmm. So we're going to continue to kind of move towards uh, what are some what are some ideas for solution as we as we move towards these kind of communities. And we'll come right back with that conversation right after this message. The average family uses seven internet devices at the same time. From online grocery shopping, to online doctor visits, to online fitness, we're more connected than ever. By 2022, a typical home could have 500 smart devices. That's why at Mediacom, we've increased all our speeds and we're bringing gigabit speeds to every community our internet serves. So while technology is changing fast, we'll continue to stay ahead. With TiVo, you can record shows to watch later, of course, but you can also access popular video apps right on your TV. And you can watch your recordings or stream live TV on your mobile device, making any screen in your home a TV screen. TiVo's free app even lets you schedule your recordings when you're not at home. Seriously, you have to watch this show. Don't mind if I do. With TiVo, you'll never have to miss a thing. For special offers on TiVo, call 888-SIMPLIFY. In every community, young people are proving their abilities to lead through accomplishment in the classroom and beyond. At Mediacom, we're proud to recognize these outstanding individuals by awarding world-class scholarships. By investing in these young leaders and their educations, 
we believe that we're creating a more promising future for everyone. Congratulations to each and every winner. Mediacom, powering the future. With Prime TV and On Demand, we can catch up on our favorite series anytime. With Prime TV, there's always something for them. Like this, or this, with Kids On Demand. That's why I upgraded. More entertainment I can watch my way. There are lots of reasons to get Prime TV. Now just $7.95 more a month for one year. With thousands of on-demand choices. And stars. And stars encore. There's more for everyone. Upgrade today and save. Call 888-SIMPLIFY for details. Welcome back. We're going to continue our conversation uh, with Do I'm going to call you Dr. Stephen. <laughs> Dr. Stephen Gray, uh, political science professor at the University of Missouri as well as black studies professor. And we're going to continue the conversation. So we've talked about a lot of the challenges. So let's talk about some of the solutions. So how do we move, how do we move towards um, a more inclusive community um, in terms of some of the things that we see going on right now? Uh, From a political perspective, yeah. um, because I'm going to go back. I have a question. So you do you think that some of the political divides that we see going in our country right now, is, it, is, it, is that really the underpinning of just differences in political ideologies? Or is, it, is, is race and poverty and all these other um, isms that are out there, mm -hmm. is that kind of the thing that's stirring the pot? Does my question make sense? Absolutely. And um, I think that the, the factions and the division in this country um, they're, they're real. I, th I absolutely think that they are real. And I do think that uh, the underlying them, that race and the idea of class and poverty is, is still kind of at the, at the root of that discussion. Um, you know, one of the things you just talked about in, our, in this previous last election is one of the biggest swing things in this election were working class, middle and lower class white folks in the middle of the country who felt like they had gotten worse for the last eight years. Mm -hmm. And a person or a candidate who spoke to that specific demographic White working class, you know, in the center of the country, it's not on the coast, but they tend to be more money, and they have, you know, more technology based. So we're talking about middle America, white middle America, um, and their needs and where they are and how they perceive their standing in the country um, can swarm uh, elections, and that's heavily racial. Uh, like we we're talking about before with uh, previous elections, is where they see themselves being disadvantaged, and who are they blaming for why they're not making it? Right. So this is uh, in some cases where immigration comes in. Why their lack of jobs? Again, because we have more and more immigration, they're taking our jobs and everything else is right. So, mm -hmm. who are they blaming for their shortcomings? And because the majority, they can s tend to swing elections and they can win elections just by focusing on target group base. One of the arguments that why Hillary didn't win, of course, is because she was perceived as too elitist for middle America and she didn't mm -hmm. speak to that working class middle American, whereas as Trump did. Um, so those are still heavily involved in the kind of fabric and the divisiveness in this country. So we're even talking about things like the tax code. There are some people on racial class grounds is obviously rich versus poor. That 1% who's controlling all the wealth in this mm -hmm. country versus the 90% of us you know, who are still scraping to get by. That's, that's the part that I understand. I could, I, I, like when we talk about the tax mm -hmm. cut, I, just on a very simple, like just keep it, like I like to keep it simple. Okay. As I'm thinking, if I'm going to get in a tax cut, it's not like we talk about this thousand dollars. Everybody's getting thousand dollars. We're going to get at least a thousand dollars. And I'm thinking it ain't like they're giving me a thousand dollar check in my hand. Right. And and I'm not even going to see that in my check. Right. And then I'm going to get mine for a hot minute, yeah. and other folks going to have this forever. I don't understand as just regular folk mm -hmm. that why would we not be up in arms about so that? So here's two very important things we're talking about taxes and the tax breaks discussion. Uh, at the first part of it is. Um, economic mobility. So a lot of people vote for and think of these tax cuts for the rich or for middle class Americans as a good thing because a lot of people think at some point or one day I will be rich too and I'll be upper class and mm. I don't want to pay those taxes myself, right? I'm going to keep working, I'm going to have a YouTube channel, right? I'll get the Instagram likes up, I'll go into modeling, I'll become an actor and when I get rich and stuff, I don't want to pay those taxes. You know, so, I never really so thought about that. And so they and they vote based on that behavior. Uh, thinking that, well, when I become a YouTube star and I make a million dollars, I don't want the government taking 60% of my paycheck, and they vote and behave that way. So All a lot right. of people think wow. that they'll be rich someday, and they vote on their potential, not on their reality. And so that idea of economic mobility is, is also important because 90%, 95% of the people in this country live and die in the same social class. So most people in this country, if you were born poor, you die poor. And if you're born rich, you die rich. Even people who win the lottery end up, if you've seen over time, end up losing it and still end up dying poor in those few rare cases. So if only 
75% of Americans are really able to and capable of and factually moving up social classes, right? The ability to go from poor to rich is steep, right? Mm -hmm. But the idea, of course, people say, keep working at it and keep doing your thing, you'll make it happen. So the idea, of course, is people think, I'll be rich someday, I want to pay those taxes, I'm going to vote for my potential. Mm -hmm. The second part of it about it is, too, is like you were saying, people think it's going to put $10,000 more dollars in your pocket over the year of zero subsidies, right? Like you said, one, you don't get that in one large jump sum. Right. Which is what people have seen, of course, is $50 more in their paycheck right. and stuff over time. Right. You're thinking, oh, that must be the tax bill, right? My, my paycheck was $75 more. Right. And of course, and then over time, over, over the year, of course, that obviously intends more money. What they don't see on that same problem, and this is kind of the delusion of taxes and of spending when you break it down, is what they don't see is one, inflation, and mm. two, the other incentives and, and projects and taxes that government wants to pay in the long run. So yes, we might give you, instead of $15,000, we might give you $1,605, but, but because people know that you've got more money, the price of goods and services will go up. Mm. So that hamburger that was, that was, that was, so, mm. so the hamburger that was $1.50 is now $1.69. You have more money, you can pay $1.69. Mm -hmm. So yes, you've got an extra 105 more dollars a month, but what you pay for in that month, the cost of those things have also then gone up. So you're mm -hmm. really not absolutely coming out in mm -hmm. the above when you think about what you have to mm -hmm. spend. Polls and poll taxes, property taxes, things that come out like that. Uh, yes, you got more money in your paycheck right now, but the things that cost when you on a month that you spend for it go up. So you're really not on the overall end up finding yourself making more money. But again, people have the impression or thought that more money in my paycheck means that I have more money. Mm. That mm -hmm. is an illusion, right? Mm -hmm. Because what happens when your rent goes up and right. the gas and gas goes up, right? Mm -hmm. So yes, they got an extra thirty dollars a month or extra three dollars a week. But gas went up from two dollar ninety nine to two fifty. So my gas every two weeks and every dollars mm -hmm. is ten dollars more. Mm -hmm. There are ten dollars right there alone just mm -hmm. in gas that eats from that forty dollars or more so you got your paycheck in the tax cuts. Same with groceries and everything else. Mm -hmm. You end up spending more. So your actual bottom line doesn't change, but you've tricked people into thinking I've got an extra fifty dollars in my paycheck, I can do more with it, I can buy more things, I can have better things. You know, but I think really that, you that, that the thing is how do we you know, it's like because most people don't think that way. Yeah. And it's almost like that folks who are making these decisions kind of know that most folks are not going to go sit down and think about the fact that, yeah, I may get a few more dollars, but what I got to pay is going to go up too. Marketing so is a, a very it's strategic it's a, it's a psychological thing. total of thing. nothing. Yeah. Psychology and the order of marketing is, is a very strategic psychological order. Like they can tell the images that you want to see that makes you go buy something. Mm -hmm. They know the images and things that you want to hear before you go sell something and will produce something. And they feed on that all the time. So politicians do the same thing. Absolutely. They know what you want to hear. They know that you want to hear more cash in your pocket. Right? Mm -hmm. Your task good. You're going to see an extra $50 in your paycheck. People are like, oh, perfect, great. But they don't, again, they don't realize that your rent went up right. an extra $100. So how do we move towards, so is it about educating ourselves? It is, so how do we, how do we, and for lack of a better word, how do we become smarter consumers? And I'm not just meaning consumer product, but consumers yeah, of, of what politics we're, what and we're the, yeah. Uh, better education. And, and with better education on top of that, and this is probably like a 1A, we just need to generate better ideas. Mm. Uh, I think what we have come to um, is really a, a restructuring of our motivations, right? Because when money becomes the end all be all and we measure our values and we measure the good based on that bottom red line, there's so much more to life to that. And it really then limits the ideas that we have because ideas that don't make money are seen to, to be as less valid. So, and things that don't make money then are seen as less valuable. So a lot of these, pro these problems that we see with limited education and limited understanding because the ideas that it takes to, to accomplish those things may not be profitable. Solving poverty in this, or homelessness may not make you rich. Does that mean we shouldn't solve it? But mm. when we make profit being the end all be all, well there's no value in me solving poverty when I ain't gonna make no money off of doing it. Mm. So what we have to do is we have to one, have an education and a, and a framework then that tries to transform the way that we value uh, our lives and the things that are important to us and a better education is usually part of that but we need better ideas which means we have to then have an educational system and have a framework then that allows for people to be creative allows for people to push the status quo and allows for people to be confrontational and have different ideas and be able to exercise those and so be that unique. starts as early as what 
elementary school? Like absolutely, school? Yeah. absolutely. I think it starts in elementary school. You have to introduce new ideas, and you have to introduce the people who came up with those ideas. Because a lot of times people will follow not just the act of dunking or throwing a basketball, but it's also the person who is doing it that they're also attracted to. Mm. And so it's not just necessarily the act, it's also the person. So highlighting people who have these ideas, not just their idea or the technology, but who is this person? Where do they come from? That way that we can identify with that person. Yes, I would like to be an architect or a scientist, not because I want to do cool projects, but it's also because the person that I've seen doing it, I can identify with. I mm. came from a background the same thing else this. So we need better ideas, and we have to have a platform of way of generating better ideas in this country to solve our problems. Uh, so is that a different way of thinking? Is it a different way of teaching? Is it a different way of? It's both, right? You have to you have to teach differently to get people to really think differently. You have to. Um, communicate in a way and you have to have uh, expectations in such a way that then challenge people then to behave and do differently. So yes, you have to teach differently, but you also have to add uh, you know, more different things in the curriculum to, ex mm. uh, to go outside of certain areas. It used to be just about reading, writing, and arithmetic. Well, yeah, well now we've figured out that history and where you come from is also heavily important in your kind mm. of educational attainment and, and your educational background and becoming mm -hmm. who you are. And so we have to allow for those things to continue to kind of grow. And we have mm -hmm. to have, again, just a plethora of different ways of thinking and ideas. And those have to be introduced in education because that's really the kind of mm -hmm. first place for which that kind of uh, process can take place. You know what? We have, um, this has been such a phenomenal. We're kind of mm -hmm. coming to, to uh, time together, mm -hmm. coming to an end. Um, this has, been, I've learned a lot today. Right. So I'm going to, I want to, I want to, I want to leave our audience with this. Um, we talked about a lot today. We talked about uh, different um, uh, areas of the government, um, checks and balances. We've talked about a lot of different things. So you, if, if you wanted to leave our audience with something today based on the things we talked about, that, mm -hmm. that's something that's most important to you as we try to move toward the more inclusive, beloved community, that we're the best version of ourselves. Because that's what this show is about, is mm -hmm. that having these conversations that may be uncomfortable, right. may be uncomfortable for us, may be uncomfortable for some of our, our, uh, our audience members, mm -hmm. but knowing that these kind of conversations is an idea to get us to start thinking about things we may not have thought about before, or, or perspective that we had not considered. Absolutely. So you have an opportunity now, if there's something that, what would, what would you like folks' takeaway to be from this conversation that we had today? Um, I would like them to take away that Greatness is accomplishable by human beings and individuals. People can still do great things. Uh, I think that you have to challenge yourself and know yourself and that intellectual virtue and that having smart and having intellect is still a very important trait no matter what aspect of life that you find yourself. But that greatness you know, can be accomplished, uh, but that greatness is also an individual choice. Mm. In order to get better, you have to do better. Mm. And also then, to, in order to do better and get better, you have to expect better. People mm. will tend to behave to their expectations. So if you want greatness, if you want to accomplish great things, one, you have to make a choice to do so. Greatness doesn't just fall in your lap. People have to make a choice. I'm going to go out there and do something great. So greatness is an individual choice. And that too, if you want to get better and, and have better, then you have to actually do better. Mm. Um, and that is a huge, important um, avenue of thing that people miss out on when they're trying to change their lives or trying to get better things. They want to get better and have better life by doing the same things, but just mm. kind of fine-tuning. Like, no, if you really have to raise a certain standard and set a certain expectation. So to get better, you have to do better. And greatness is still accomplishable, uh, but it's a choice. You have to make an individual choice to be great, but, it, but it can be done. Oh, I'm going to end on that note. <laughs> so it doesn't get much better than that. Thank you. So thank you so much, Dr. Grace, for, I for appreciate being here today. No, I, this is a I learned a lot today. <laughs> I learned a whole lot today. Oh. And I was a political science major, and I didn't get all that when I was in school. That's why I took the job. That's what they did. <laughs> <laughs> so again, uh, as always, we thank you for joining us today. We hope that um, you learned something today. And as always, when you're having those conversations, keep those conversations real and always come from a place of love. Video and music fans. You don't have to settle for this. Well, you can watch like this. Access apps like Pandora, YouTube, and Netflix right on your TV with Extreme. Powered by Mediacom. 145 over 92. 180 over 111. 182 over 100.
and I had a heart attack and a cardiac arrest and then a stroke. This is what high blood pressure looks like. You might not feel its symptoms, but the results from a heart attack or stroke are far from invisible or silent. My memory is shot. When I woke up, I couldn't speak. I can't button up a shirt. I can't run. I've had to learn to swallow again. That's the only more minutes that I have. And I'm 33, so I never see this coming. If I would have followed a treatment plan, I would not be in this situation. Had I done this, had I done that, hell, I messed up. Get back on your plan or talk with your doctor to create an exercise, diet, and medication plan that works for you. Go to loweryourhbp.org. I had to tell everything's changed. I had to tell them.